Good afternoon, colleagues and, and uh, all our viewers. We will begin with a public hearing on a resolution to implement additional funding for the Restaurant Relief Grant Program. The next item regards funding recommended by the Biden administration passed by Congress via the Relief Act of 2021, passed to us by a state grant. Thank goodness for the Biden administration and the new Congress. Action will immediately follow the public hearing. Welcome, Mr. Wu, Mr. Tompkins, any of your team that is here. Uh, each individual will have two minutes to speak. Individuals will be alerted as they approach their two minutes and may be disconnected. Also, there may be technical glitches during the public hearing that may need to be addressed by our staff. So thanks in advance for your patience. Ms. Kennedy, if you don't mind, could you call on the first speaker, please? Ms. Kennedy? I was going to say we might proceed, but it might mean that we aren't ready to go, actually, if, if we're not hearing. Oh, I beg your pardon. Maybe we didn't get the, I didn't get the countdown. I beg your pardon. I don't know. I Sorry. Jump the gun. Equin? Council President, we are currently live. Oh, great. Okay. Ms. Kennedy, is there a, a speaker for this hearing? Council President, I believe there are no speakers. No hearing, no speakers for this hearing. Okay. Is there, um, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Wu, do you have any comments on this or should we take a vote? It would be great to hear from Mr. Wu uh, and, and Mr. Tompkins. Thank you. Well, well, thank you, uh, Mr. President uh, and Fed Committee Chairman Reamer. Uh, it's a pleasure to be before uh, the council again today to be able to offer another round of restaurant relief fund grants uh, to an industry that's been particularly hit hard by the pandemic. Uh, you know, we watched uh, this morning uh, with great anticipation uh, because we're all collectively, I think, very optimistic about the fact that soon we'll be heading towards the other side of this pandemic crisis. Uh, and for the restaurants in our localities, uh, these grants can help our uh, local restaurants sustain themselves until that day comes. Uh, and so we're very pleased to be able to offer another opportunity uh, for restaurants uh, to be able to uh, receive direct assistance uh, from the county uh, via the state grants. Uh, and, and we think that uh, this will uh, continue to help support uh, this industry uh, that has been uh, devastated by the economy uh, and the pandemic. So uh, we look forward to uh, working uh, with uh, the council as uh, this uh, legislation passes. Uh, we want to thank particularly the county executive uh, and also uh, Councilman Friedson uh, for uh, their efforts in helping to uh, refine not just this phase of the restaurant relief program, but also phases uh, one and two. Uh, I also want to note uh, that this particular uh, program, this phase three round, uh, has prioritized uh, outreach to economically disadvantaged and small women and minority owned businesses. Uh, and to continue to so help support this continued priority, uh, we have developed uh, downloadable flyers translated to six languages, encouraging uh, these applications uh, to be uh, shared and also can be found on our website. And we would encourage uh, not just the council members uh, with their constituent outreach, but also anyone who's listening to, to be able to share this information widely uh, so that we can continue to provide uh, grants to new recipients as well. I will say that we have been very successful uh, in reaching out to the small and minority owned businesses uh, in the past for phase one and phase two. Uh, we have had a substantial number of recipients uh, that fit that category and we want to continue to make sure uh, that these disadvantaged businesses and these underrepresented communities uh, in the restaurants uh, are also going to be able You were muted there, your last sentence. Oh, I just, I just wanted to thank uh, the council and uh, the president uh, for the opportunity to speak, so thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Wu, and Mr. Tompkins for being here. Our restaurants really need this support um, and there are no speakers for the hearing. So uh, with that, 
unless there are any comments from my colleagues, I think we can, um, Madam Clerk, can you please call the roll? This is a hand vote. You'll need a motion first. So move, move approval. Second. second. Uh, Chairman moves, Councilmember Fries and seconds. Terrific. All those in favor of this resolution, please raise your hand. Aye, Mr. President. That is unanimous among those present. Councilmember. Yeah, that is unanimous. Terrific. Good work, everybody. Our restaurants, thank you. Um, okay, next is a special appropriation to the county government's FY21 operating budget, Montgomery County Economic Development, non departmental account. Um, support for COVID response, restaurant relief program. Okay, da, 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 sorry. Next one is the hotel relief program, $1,739,544 and online sales program, $86,977, totaling $1,826,521 source of funds. State grant, of course, passed uh, through Congress as part of the Relief Act of 2021. Apparently there are no hearing, uh, speakers for this hearing as well. Um, any comments from my colleagues? Councilmember Friedson. Yeah, thank you, Mr. President. This is uh, similar to the restaurant relief program with state funds. This is the hotel relief program, the, the latest phase of it with additional funds. I just wanted to thank Ms. Uh, uh, Boyer and Mr. Van Horn from Visit MoCo. They've uh, been partnering with uh, the county, the, the finance team and business advancement team. I always get the name uh, wrong. I'm hoping I got it right uh, now. I've been working together on this. Just wanted to express my continued appreciation for the collaboration and coordination. Obviously, our hospitality industry has been hit very hard during the pandemic, and it's not enough, but it's something, and it continues to uh, build on the uh, relief efforts that the county and the state have uh, have done. So I just wanted to, to note that. And uh, if uh, you're ready for it, I would uh, move approval at the appropriate time. Councilmember Friedson moves. Is there a second? Councilmember Friedz, Council Member Reamer seconds. Any other comments from my colleagues? Okay. Uh, uh, thanks to everybody for being here for this item. This is very important as well. Our hotels really need the help. All those in favor, please raise your hand. Aye, Mr. President. That is unanimous. Terrific. Okay, item seven is approved. Next is a public hearing to consider a special appropriation to the FY21 operating budget at Montgomery County Public Schools. $112,233,764 for the elementary and secondary school emergency relief fund to grant. Action will fee follow the public hearing, but there are no public, no speakers for the public hearing. Any, can I get a motion to move the resolution, please? So moved. Second. Councilmember Jawando moves, Councilmember Navarro seconds. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor of this, um, Special appropriation, please raise your hand. Aye, Mr. President. That is nine, that is unanimous. This special appropriation is approved as well. Thank you so much. Next, we'll have a public hearing to consider action on a special appropriation of the FY21 operating budget, Montgomery County Public Schools, $1,274,619 for the pre-kindergarten enhancement grant. Action will immediately follow the public hearing, but there are no speakers for that public hearing either. Is there a motion to approve this resolution? So move. Councilmember Cass Second. moves. Councilmember Reamer seconds. Any discussion? All those in favor of this special appropriation, please raise your hand. Aye, Mr. President. That's nine. Okay. Passes unanimously. Thank you all so much. Next, we'll have a presentation by our planning staff on our countywide demographic changes. Planning staff from MNC PPC are presenting to us their demographic analysis of Montgomery County. This study was requested originally by Council Member Novato to give us a better understanding of the county's growth over the last several years. We need to better understand our population growth and our social determinants of growth to better plan and to serve our residents for the future. Let me first call on Ms. Michelson and then she can introduce the planning team. Oh, oh, let me, Council Member Navarro, please. 
Thank you. Uh, I want to uh, express my appreciation to um, the planning um, department, uh, Mr. Anderson, in particular, who I uh, reached out and requested um, if uh, we could uh, have uh, their team make a presentation to the council and also want to thank Council President Hucker and Council Vice President Alboranos. Because when I reached out to you, you enthusiastically said, yes, we need to do this. Um, we've done, we have received these types of presentations in the past. Uh, and I think it, it was just seems very timely um, because, of course, we will be getting more updated information when the census comes through. But obviously, uh, I believe that our county is going to go to another transition very soon in terms of leadership. Uh, and as we, I think, have been very focused through this pandemic um, in terms of the kinds of infrastructure uh, uh, that we have in the county, in order to serve our residents. There's been a theme throughout this conversation, in my opinion, and it has to do with structural um, changes, with instituting also infrastructure that is um, structural in nature to address many of the issues that have emerged, but some of the issues that we all are very familiar with. And when this council did all the work in 2019 around the issue of racial equity and social justice, we also took on other structural issues like early care and education, like economic development, looking at it through the lens of, you know, updating many of our approach and our strategic thinking and adapting that to who we are here in Montgomery County. Um, oftentimes I have uh, expressed my views that when we are making decisions, it seems like there are moments where there seems to be a disconnect between our narrative and who we are. We tend to continue to talk about uh, particular service delivery uh, models or budgetary decisions as, you know, nice things to do or important things to do, uh, when in reality we're talking about services and, and budgetary decisions that are necessary to serve the county residents. And so when we say that diversity is our strength, I think it's so critical to truly understand what that means to truly understand who our constituents are. And that also has to do with fiscal responsibility because we have a really very robust budget. I mean, I think pretty soon we're gonna be hitting the $6.4 billion mark, but we need to know who our residents are, um, where there may be particular kinds of strategies that are gonna be most effective in order to be the best stewards possible of our taxpayers' dollars. If there is a disconnect between our perception of our constituents and the types of service delivery models and the types of budgetary decisions we make, obviously that is not the best use of our dollars. And so I see this as a very critical, uh, very important uh, socioeconomic issue uh, that we must continually check in to have that understanding. Uh, earlier today, as we were giving Dr. Smith a proclamation, I spoke about how when I joined the Board of Education, I would mentally always have this, you know, thought in my head every single time we had budget hearings, I could predict which clusters would be requesting translation services. And by the time I left the board five years, uh, between 2004, 2009, I could no longer predict it because it was being requested throughout the county. And that's just an anecdotal uh, way of just saying that, yes, our county has changed dramatically for, I think, over almost 35 years or so. We've seen a dramatic change. And that change drives the way that we make land use decision, the way that we make decisions about education, that we make decisions about transportation, housing, workforce development, activity centers, everything has to be guided through this. So. I just want to thank um, the planning staff who um, has put together this really awesome updated um, demographic information. And I look forward to, to the presentation and also to the dialogue. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, council member. Um... And um, I, I will just add, I think the council president and the geo share Chair said everything I would have said by way of introduction. So um, I'll just turn it over to planning staff. I assume Ms. Wright might want to start with an introduction, but I'll turn it over to them. Thank you. Welcome, Ms. Wright.
Thank you. I, I would like to make just a very brief introduction. Um, I'm so um, uh, thrilled to be here with our staff from our Research and Strategic Projects Division. We have really uh, created a division that does uh, detailed research that is our think tank for new trends in the county. Uh, that's been one of our goals. And I think we've really accomplished it. I want to uh, give a lot of that credit to uh, Carrie McCarthy, who is the chief of that division. And she is here and is going to be part of the presentation, as well as Tanya Stern, who is the deputy director who oversees this division. Um, you know, a lot of the themes that have been discussed are really part of what you're going to be hearing more about in Thrive Montgomery 2050 uh, and what we wanted that general plan update to be and what we want all of our projects to be are data-driven, thoughtful kinds of uh, analyses so that we can really understand the trends for the future in the county and be able to plan uh, accordingly to to address and and uh, respond to all of those trends. So with that, I think I'm going to turn it over to Carrie McCarthy to say uh, a few words and then her staff, Corinne Blackford and Nick Holtzcomb are going to do a, a good portion of the presentation. Good afternoon. Um, I, I'm not going to say much. I just, yeah, we'll introduce um, Corinne Blackford, who is our lead forecaster and demographic analyst. Um, and Nicholas Holtzcomb, um, who's one of our key research planners and GIS experts, and they'll walk you through the presentation. Um, this is essentially the same presentation they had given to the redistricting commission. Um, it's, you know, it's really our pleasure to work with that commission and do that important work um, uh, with, under the leadership of um, Pam Dunn and Jeff Zions. Um, and so we're happy to be here um, today to, sh to share that information with you. And so with that, I'll turn it over to Corinne and Nick. Thank you, Carrie. Thank you, Gwen. Um, I'm Corinne Blackford. Great. I see the presentation up. Um, Nick, are you driving? Can you give me a... Okay. Yeah, I'm driving. All right. Thanks, Nick. All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, as was already stated, we are from the Research and Strategic Projects Division of the Planning Department. Um, we're going to show you this presentation that we made recently for the Redistricting Commission. And it was designed to help them with their analysis as they make council district recommendations. So it includes a lot of up-to-date uh, data on county populations and geography that is likely to be of interest to all of you as well. So the first slide. First, we're going to present an overview of the county's population growth, emphasizing this past decade since the last census was completed in 2010. I'll talk about the origins of our population growth, as well as some of the characteristics of our current population. Then we'll look at the geographic distribution of our population, highlighting a few social characteristics like age, income. And then we'll take an in-depth look at the geography of race and ethnicity, that is uh, how racial and ethnic characteristics differ by location, and then how that has changed over time. So next slide. Let's first summarize our uh, total population and our estimated growth since 2010. We now have over a million total residents living in the county, and it's estimated that we gained about 76,000 since 2010 in the last census. The forthcoming 2020 census data will give us the best indication of where we stand in terms of uh, population and growth. That becomes available September 30th. So next slide. So although I said uh, 76,000 new people, and that sounds like a lot, and of course it is, uh, as a large jurisdiction, um, we are actually relatively mature in terms of our development, and we are growing at a small annual rate, and that rate has been decreasing. So here in this graph, you can see the blue lines indicating our annual growth rate, the solid background fill, uh, shows absolute growth each year, and you can see that growth continues each year, but it's tapering off. 
It's expected that we will continue to grow at that relatively small annual rate, and that nevertheless translates into a significant number of new residents each year. Next slide. So this chart, this chart, excuse me, shows you the components of, or origins of our population growth. New residents um, either move here or they're born here. So net migration in yellow refers to people who moved here offset by those who moved away. And net natural increase, the green bars, refer to the number of people who were born here offset uh, by those who died here. So you can see most recently that more people have moved away than moved here, giving us negative net migration. And more people were born here than died here, giving us positive uh, net natural increase. And natural increase has been large enough to offset losses from migration uh, or negative net migration. Um, and natural increase is our primary source of population growth. The gray line here shows the annual population increase over time. Um, and you can see it's declining since 2010. Back during the Great Recession, so-called uh, net migration actually remained positive for a while. And that's a pattern for our region during recessions generally. Uh, when the national economy isn't doing very well in terms of employment, people move here and or they stay here rather than moving away. And when the national economy picks up, uh, a lot of people in our region are able to move away elsewhere and pursue other opportunities. So because of that recession and its long aftermath, um, our county actually had higher population growth due to positive net migration at the start of this decade. And then you can see how that changed. Next slide. So let's look closer at net natural increase. Uh, migration is the more fickle component of growth, but births and deaths in our county are fairly stable. There are usually about twice as many births as deaths and you can see from the gray line in this chart that uh, net natural population increase is fairly flat over time. And then there's a slight dip down just the past couple of years. Next slide. So that, that slight dip reflects a declining birth rate, um, which has been on the decline for quite a while. This is a national trend as well as a regional trend. We're not alone in this at all. It's not specific to us. Um, and even though we have a larger population who could potentially give birth each year, the rate of those who do is down. Uh, so, so far, even though the actual number of births each year has been steady, further down the road, if that rate continues to fall, we might actually see a, a smaller number of annual births each year. And eventually, we may also see a larger number of deaths each year uh, as our baby boomer population a very large cohort that is aging as they reach their final years. Next slide. So let's look back at net migration more closely, uh, the way I just looked at natural increase. Uh, recall that positive net migration is not the primary source of our population growth in the past uh, decade, but it's nevertheless important, uh, particularly during economic recessions when we tend to see that uh, there's more. So we can see from this graph how international migration differs from domestic migration. So international migration, the orange bars, has tended to be positive. Uh, so we gained more movers from abroad than we lost to other countries. Meanwhile, domestic migration, the blue bars, tend to be negative, so that we lose more residents to other places in the U.S. than we typically gain from them. Um, and during the Great Recession, you can see those years and its immediate aftermath, that trend stalled. Uh, as previously mentioned, people stayed put or they came here in search of work due to the government-based economy. Um, and then later they were able to move on. So over that past decade, we've sometimes gained population due to positive net migration. But most recently, uh, we've seen more people leaving than arriving. And the origins of population growth uh, that I showed you towards the beginning of this presentation with the yellow and green bars uh, that showed you those positive green bars for net natural increase and negative yellow bars for net migration. Um, that's where we are today. And we'll see what the, the COVID recession ultimately has in store for us. Um, next slide. 
So let's talk a little bit about uh, the social characteristics of our population, not just population change over time. Knowing that positive uh, international migration is an important part of our overall migration, we'll look at uh, residents' regions of uh, origin and their countries of origin. So here I'm showing you that Latin America and Asia are by far the most common regions of origin. And you can see there's a list of countries on the left, the top 10 countries of origin, and El Salvador and India and China are the top three, and all the other countries on this list are also from Latin America or Asian countries. Next slide. It's notable that uh, more than 40% of county residents speak a language besides English at home on a regular basis, um, and that is whether they moved here from abroad or not. Um, only 58% speak only English at home. So Spanish is by far the most spoken non-English language, followed by this broad category of other Indo-European languages, which includes um, languages such as Hindi and Bengali, among others, uh, from India and Asia. Next slide. So looking at the racial and ethnic diversity in the county, uh, we can tell that we're becoming more racially and ethnically diverse over time. Today, there is no one predominant racial category as they're currently defined by the U.S. Census Bureau. And uh, that has been true for the past decade. There has not been a racial majority of any one of these groups. Next slide. If we examine uh, racial and ethnic diversity across age brackets, uh, we can explain this trend and sort of the inevitability of increasing diversity over time. So among Hispanic, Black, and Asian populations, the larger shares are in their younger, younger age groups, um, under 45 years of age. So in those bars, look at the sizes of the yellow, orange, and, and pink uh, bars for those populations, and you can tell that they're, they're bigger. Those are the biggest. Meanwhile, um, the white non-Hispanic population has larger shares in the older age groups. Look at the blue and the gray. Those are the biggest for them. So as the non-Hispanic white population continues to age, more residents and future residents um, naturally fall into the other category. Next slide. So now that we've looked at the characteristics of our population as a whole uh, across the county, let's look at geography and how population changes depending on where you are. Next slide. So this map just shows the county divided into the five council districts because it was for the districting presentation. Um, and you can see our major highways for reference, but these purple dots show the concentration of county residents. And each dot represents 50 people. Uh, darker clusters of dots are seen in our population centers, as you might expect. Those centers are uh, Silver Spring, Tacoma Langley, White Oak, the Aspen Hill Wheaton area, Montgomery Village, Gaithersburg, Germantown, and Bethesda and North Bethesda. Next slide. This map shows where population increase has recently occurred relative to um, the existing. So those purple dots are still the current population. And then the pink dots uh, represent change since 2010. You can tell the pink dots are mainly concentrated in the same places as the purple dots uh, because existing population centers tend to attract more residents, um, which is sort of just a natural phenomenon for all communities. Um, but here you can also see that there, there is a prevalence of pink dots um, up in Clarksburg uh, in the center of the map also, where Rockville and Gaithersburg meet, which would roughly correspond to King Farm, Gaith or Crown Farm areas, both of those areas. Um, also in only Fairland and Burtonsville. So growth in the past decade in those places really expanded those communities in recent years, uh, creating uh, more of a center than there had been, more of a population center anyway than there had been. Next slide. If we look at how uh, places vary by age, we can see a major outlier up in Leisure World. So I have highlighted that for you. All the residents there are older um, and, and the larger dots on this map in general indicate the higher median age. So up in Leisure World, the, the median age is between 67 and 80. 
And you'll note that our countywide meeting age is just shy of 40, 39 years. The small dots show uh, where a median age is between 29 and 42. And you can see that uh, almost all of those are in the east part of the county, up through Wheaton, and then a batch of them in the Clarksburg area uh, where many new homes have been built and families are located. So the largest dots are seen in the west, uh, in Friendship Heights, North Bethesda, Potomac, Western Rockville. Uh, next slide. If you look at this next map, you'll see dots only where the median age is at least 50, and that's very high. Uh, our countywide uh, median near 40 uh, is, is high enough to foretell an aging community. But these 50 plus locations in Friendship Heights, Bethesda, North Bethesda, Potomac, Leisure World, Fairland, Central Gaithersburg, Laytonsville, and Barnesville are where eight, uh, residents are aging in place in those communities and the median age has gotten really high. Last map. So this map is the last I'll talk about today and it shows you how median income varies across the county. The darker green areas have the highest median income up to $250,000 per year. In those locations, half of households are earning at least that much. The lightest areas have the lowest median, just over $41,000 per year. Half of households in those areas earn less than that. So you can tell um, from most of the darkest areas that they're, they're adjacent to each other and they're in the far west part of the county for the most part, while these lightest areas are um, along the corridors, they're in Silver Spring, Wheaton, up through our border with Prince George's, and then along um, I-270 through Rockville, Gaithersburg, and Germantown. Um, this disparity is noteworthy given that our countywide median income of $108,000 um, to have so much of our our most populated areas, our population centers, fall into either the very dark or the very light, uh, means that um, they're either at 230% of our already high uh, countywide median, in the case of the darkest green, or they're at just 16% of our median, in the case of the lightest area. So we have some very prosperous communities, even when compared to a relatively prosperous county as a whole, uh, but they are geographically distinct from places where there is economic insecurity. So now that I have told you a bit about the present day population, we're going to shift to examining the geography of race and how that has changed over time. Nick Holtzcomb is going to talk about uh, important geographic boundaries that we use when we are analyzing populations and also show you how uh, race by place is changing and has changed. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Corinne. Um, and thank you, uh, County Council, for having us here today. Um, so I will be showing you a series of maps and graphs that illustrate how the county's changed um, from a racial predominance perspective between the years 1990 and 2019. We'll be looking at decennial census population data from 1990 to 2010, and then five-year estimates for 2019 from the American Community Survey, um, as obviously the 2020 data has not been fully released. Um, but first, uh, we should go a little bit into the geography um, that we'll be seeing for these maps, and as well as some of the maps that Kuhn showed. Um, and those are census tracts. Uh, so what is a census tract? Um, it's an area roughly equivalent to a neighborhood established by the Census Bureau for analyzing populations. It is the largest level of population division of a county um, with populations roughly between 2,500 and 8,000 people. Um, uh, it, they're contiguously drawn with the intention of being maintained over time and they're used for the following statistical analyses and more for uh, basic population statistics. Um, so, with that said, uh, this is the census geography hierarchy, sub-county. As, as we're seeing on the left, uh, where it says Southern Montgomery County and has the little, um, little hat, uh, that is Southern um, Montgomery County. So, to the right of the, the point would be uh, Silver Spring and Tacoma Park. To the left, we would eventually get to Friendship Heights and Bethesda. 
Um, so the second diagram shows one census tract, and these are these are real things. This is not a made up uh, illustration. From that, within with it, pardon me, within that census tract, we have we see four census block groups. Within that, we see 79 census blocks, and then finally, the graphic all the way on the right shows how they nest together. Um, so some things to observe before we roll through this map sequence uh, in Montgomery County and anywhere specifically um, is that the tract sizes are different, right? So so they're based on a certain amount of population. So the larger the tract, the less populated. Uh, the county tends to be wider and less dense the farther up county. There is um, less racial predominance down county to the eastern part of the county and along the I-270 corridor. Um, there is a general becoming of more diversity, as in no racial predominance. And um, tracks are having uh, population majorities that are persons of color. Um, so I apologize, uh, just to pause for one second. Um, as we move on to the maps, I will ask you to note the um, in the map, the darkest blues becoming lighter. This is white predominance um, blending into a white majority. Um, I would ask you to observe uh, increased yellow throughout the map. These this is uh, these are tracks that have no predominant group, and I would ask you to observe non-blue and non-yellow areas. These are growing majority persons of color tracks. Additionally, the top graph shows population distribution. Um, in a percent, and I would ask you to look at the first bar. This is the white population. Um, both of these tables have been normalized so that the, the percentages and the counts remain constant. So we, you'll, you'll observe uh, the population distribution change. Um, the bottom graph is uh, looking at land by acres, and I would ask you similarly to look at the far right, which is the no predominance group. So here is the 1990 map. This, in this, we see uh, white predominance with small amounts of yellow in the down county. Remember, what blue is white predominance, yellow is no predominant group. Um, as we scroll through to 2000, um, we're seeing the eastern edge of the county, Wheaton, Gaithersburg, Rockville, becoming less predominantly anything. Um, we're seeing white distribution and acreage decreasing. And we're seeing uh, some tracks with a black majority. As we continue to move through time, we see uh, significantly inc significant increases in this no predominance group, the yellow group, moving up the I-270 corridor and filling much of the eastern side of the county. We also see uh, black and Hispanic majorities in tracks around Wheaton and Langley, for example. And then finally, into 2019, we just see a furthering of the pattern. We see more Hispanic tracks, and we even now see a, an Asian majority. Um, the little yellow piece, I was I was interested in that. That is the tract around Westfield Mall. So what we heard was helpful from the redistricting group is to scroll back and forth a time or two just to sort of see these patterns. So again, we're going to see the dark blue become lighter or even yellow. We're going to see the yellow start out in the southern part of the county, down county, and then move east, as well as moving up north following the I-270 corridor. And we're going to see the um, creation of some of these non-yellow, non-blue tracks, which indicate uh, Black, Hispanic, or Asian majorities. So here we are, 1990 again. Yeah, so finally, we can compare um, the first year, 1990, to this final year, 2019. And this is an attempt to do so in a simplified graphic way. Um, so what we're, what we're seeing is in the solid background, uh, we're seeing 1990. And then in the outlined um, dashed piece, we're seeing in 2019. It's just, just a different way to visualize and illustrate the change over time. Um, so to summarize uh, some of the racial predominance um, 
in 2019, we see that tracts with no racial predominance have around two-thirds people of color. We're seeing higher percentages of people of color um, with, uh, where the number of Hispanic residents is highest. So there's a correlation between those. And this, these, these bars show the racial breakdown um, of residents in these tracts. Moving along, this was not shown uh, to the redistricting committee, but it was something that Council Member Navarro um, wondered about, or we heard about her wondering about it, uh, which, which was to sort of parse out some of this yellow, amorphous, uh, no predominant zone thing. Um, so what we're seeing on the left, the left map, the inset map, is what we saw a few slides ago and discussed. We're seeing this large band of yellow. And to the right, we're seeing the outline of that band with um, exploring the block groups. We remember that the block groups nest within the tracks. So we try to tease out what, um, what block group, what it looks like at the block group level. Um, and granted, uh, this is only about one third of the block groups um, as the margin of error uh, is reliable at this level. Um, and we see a fair number of Hispanic majority and black predominance from this view. Um, it speaks to a lot of things, but uh, one thing it definitely speaks to is the power in which uh, these block groups and tracks nest with one another to, to create uh, the, the data and the trends that we see. Um, so now that we see all these patterns, we can overlay a few other geographies to, to explore further. Uh, what we're seeing here are what are called equity focus areas. This was created by planning staff and it is being further refined and explored. And there will be many uh, data products that come about using this data um, in the coming months and, and beyond. Um, so what we're seeing is these equity focus areas. And we see that there are 56 tracks, which make up about a quarter of all the tracks. Uh, and it contains about 27% of the total population and only 8% of the total land. And so when we lay that upon the 2019 uh, census tract map that we looked at and been talking about, um, we see these EFA changes over time. We see that um, 16 have gone from white predominance to no predominance. We see that 15 have gone from white majority to no predominance. And we see that nine have gone from white majority to a Hispanic majority. We can also look at uh, independent towns and villages. This is, this is sort of a smattering of um, non-census designated, non-CBD places uh, that include the following in their acreages. Um, so we see it, uh, it involves Tacoma Park, um, the Chevy Chase villages and sections and uh, towns and whatever. Um, we see Poolsville uh, and everything else along with their acreage. Now we can lay that over the 2019 predominance. And um, this table to the right is describing, uh, if we look at the boldened ones, it's describing the 1990 racial predominance and then the 2019 racial predominance. So we see, for example, Brookville Town went from white pre predominance to a white majority. Uh, and we also see that Rockville City, for example, went from a white majority to no predominance. Um, so with that, I'll pass it over to Corinne to just sort of wrap us up. Great. Thank you for that, Nick. Uh, so here's a very brief summary that we hope helps you take away some key points. Uh, uh, in terms of age, the over 65 population is up and rising. We are an aging community. The under five population is falling as our birth rates, and that younger population is more diverse. Um, increasing diversity is happening, but there is geographic segregation along racial lines. And I showed you that uh, the income map um, is basically correlated with the race map, uh, there's, a, there's a shared pattern between those two things. Next slide. And then in terms of the geographic uh, distribution of the population overall, that up county area, it remains wider and, and less densely populated despite increasing diversity. 
Um, but as Nick showed you, it, it went from white predominant to white majority in a lot of cases. So it, it's becoming more diverse as well. And then down county uh, and eastern county along two, this 270 corridor are the, uh, less, there's almost no racial predominance down there. That is our most uh, diverse area of the county. And more and more tracts over time are becoming more racially diverse and having person of color majority. And we welcome any questions or follow-up information um, that you would like to see. And you're welcome to reach out for us. Uh, if it doesn't occur to you right now, uh, please feel free to touch base with us later. And um, we will get you any information that, that you request. Thank you. Thank you all. This is very powerful. Uh, and very timely and helpful. Uh, let me first call on Fed Chair Reamer. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Navarro, for asking for the presentation. Very interesting. Uh, you know, certainly confirms and uh, reiterates trends that we've been uh, working our way through at, from a policy perspective for, for many years. And uh, I think it's important to always get grounded in these uh, this kind of data. Um, I, I don't know. I'm not sure if I have a question yet. I'll keep. I'll keep thinking about that. But my my comment generally is that um, this is the story of Montgomery County becoming dynamic and exciting and interesting and complex, um, urbanized economically more powerful um, and more relevant. You know, it, it's these trend lines that probably, I mean, I didn't, I wasn't born here um, in this in this part of the country, but it's these trend lines that attracted me to want to move to Montgomery County. Um, and it's the story of a county that's getting better with each passing year. Um, it, I think, Another subtext of this is that this has been resisted. This trend line has been resisted at each step. And it's been resisted through a, a lot of policies that we've, actually some of the most symbolic policies I think we've, we've recently undone, like housing moratoriums. I, I mean, the story of fighting against development is the story of fighting against demographic change in Montgomery County. It's pure and simple. And, you know, I, I think a lot of those involved in that won't admit it. And that may not be their conscious motivation, but it is a reality that the way that the county has diversified has been through the expansion of our housing supply. And, it, you know, the housing supply change has made it possible for the otherwise national trends to play out here you know, national regional trends, um, attracting people to this region and, and so on. And so, you know, it's a, it's a common tale to see local governments trying to make it as hard as possible to get as picky as possible to, you know, make it uh, endlessly difficult and complex and incredibly expensive. Um, and, you know, we took a big whack at that this, this past year by abolishing the moratorium policy, uh, by trying to get our impact taxes down to a more reasonable level. I mean, the idea that we would have tax on new housing that approaches $50,000 a unit, you know, is pretty amazing when you step back and think about it. That's a lot of money. Um, but, uh, you know, it, we, we see it playing out in all of our master plans and we saw it in the, in the debate over accessory dwelling units you know, that was a, uh, it was largely a unifying and consensus process, but towards the end, there were some rather hostile characters that weighed in and I think changed the tenor of that debate. But um, so I guess, no, I do have a question. I, I just, I'd love to hear from planning about how you see these trend lines playing out in, in Thrive 2050 and we'll be working our way through that this summer. We've got our, 
public hearings coming up, and then you know we'll we're, we we've got a we've got a lot on our plates, but we're we're our goal is to move quickly through Thrive 2050, um, and you know get it done. So, uh, you know, I, if you I'd appreciate your comments to connect the dots here. I mean, I could I could try to do that myself, but I think you'd do a better job. So, uh, I'll ask our planning team for that comment. Yeah, I, I would start and I'd ask, you know, Tanya or Carrie, who both have been very involved with Thrive Montgomery to also uh, weigh in. You know, from the beginning, when we were thinking of the framework for Thrive Montgomery, we knew that uh, the issue of um, equity was going to be an incredibly important issue. We understood that Economic health was also important, environmental sustainability. We all, you know, are experiencing the, um, the issues of climate change. But what we think is something that sort of pulls the whole uh, general plan together is this idea that we are a changing county and we have to not rest on our laurels, but think to the future. And that uh, part of thinking to the future is thinking about how we uh, grow in a logical and sustainable way, particularly along our corridors, how we create complete communities that allow for uh, social connectedness. One of the things that our suburban growth has um, created is a lot of isolation, frankly. And we aren't um, as connected as communities as we uh, were, uh, you know, when the earlier versions of the general plan were done. So um, as we diversify and as we change as a county, I think it becomes all the more important to think about how we can create complete communities which, which have uh, connectedness from a um, uh, moving around standpoint, you know, we need to have safe places for people to walk uh, and places for them to walk to. We need to have more uh, public gatherings uh, places, more co-location of different kinds of public amenities and facilities. Uh, we need to create a, a county that doesn't um, sort of um, exacerbate the idea of isolation and separateness. It needs to be a county that actually promotes connect connectedness and, and social interaction among all of our very, very uh, diverse residents. Um, and I think what we see with the data that uh, has just been presented to you is that, you know, we have a challenge. We are changing we cannot just keep doing what we've always done and rest on our laurels and think that everything's going to be the same and everything's going to be just fine. We have to start thinking differently about how we grow, about how we create communities, about how we deal with transportation issues. And I think all of those things are addressed in Thrive Montgomery. I don't know if Tanya or Carrie, if you'd like to add anything. I just wanted to add a couple of additional thoughts. One is that the um, the trends that this data shows and kind of the themes that Glenn just covered, all of this will really impact how the council and the county government will think about and make decisions on uh, what types of public facilities and where new public facilities will will um, will be implemented. What types of other changes in the physical environment that affect uh, other parts of county government besides uh, land use um, in the planning department. So this is this is this is these are the types of trends that have impacts on a wide range of the types of things that we all want to provide for our communities to be successful and to thrive. And um, I think just a more immediate example of how this uh, this data and these trends is really informing how we approach our work in the planning department is the attainable housing strategies initiative, which we will be coming back to you uh, in the coming months uh, with some recommendations. But Thrive Montgomery certainly emphasizes the need to not only build more housing because we just need more housing, but also to provide more types of housing, um, 
than what is already uh, allowed and kind of what we see in the county because we have residents with lots of different types of housing needs. You know, there's obviously um, the concern about making sure housing is actually affordable so that people can, can live in the county, but not everyone needs a large single family home and not everyone wants to live in a high rise apartment building. So we have residents who have lots and lots of different types of housing needs. And so we have to think differently about what types of opportunities they have to find housing in the county. And so this is just kind of one example of where this data is kind of, uh, is, um, you know, really impacting actual policies and guidance that we have to figure out right now. I'll just add briefly, before we started Thrive around 2018, we did a comprehensive trends report that we had come and presented to you. So we really spent a whole year digging deeply into the data, um, the demographics, housing, employment, um, and that informed how we shaped the plan, how we developed it. Um, Gwen and Tanya, you know, both covered housing, transportation. Parks is another big area that, you know, we're thinking about differently as, as the population diversifies and as the urban forum diversifies, um, that parks needs to serve the community differently. Um, and lastly, I'll just say, I think the trend that keeps me up at night is really the aging of the population because it has such significant implications for our workforce. And we need those younger workforce um, members and they need affordable places they to live and they need places for their families. So I think that's really a trend we see. And you know, with the housing needs assessment, we saw there's a kind of a spatial mismatch between size of households and size of housing units. Um, and we want people to be able to stay in their homes, stay in their community. Um, so it is coming up with a solution that, you know, allows that and then also provides um, younger people, you know, people new to the community with places to live and um, transportation options to get to work um, and jobs. Yeah, that's great points. Thank you to everyone. As, you know, just to build on what you're saying, tying them together, like, as, as you said, uh, Tanya, working on the attainable housing strategies, it's, it's, a workforce strategy, I think, in a lot of ways. And to Carrie's point, one of the red flags for us over recent years has been our inability to get our share of young workers in the region. And the young workers have really migrated or been attracted to Northern Virginia, DC. And it has, it has decades long consequence for us if we don't have our you know, good share of that demographic. And um, we need a more assertive strategy here to attract and retain young, young adults, young workers uh, for economic reasons, for uh, you know, county financial reasons, uh, for cultural reasons. You know, there's, there's, so many, there's so many reasons why, but um, it should be something that we, we can all get together on and make a priority and, uh, and understand that that's one thing we're trying to do is make this county, you know, more successful, and a lot, some of that is job focus. Some of that is housing focus. Some of that is is cultural focused, and, and we've been taking pieces out of that agenda. But it is a broader theme for us that we need to to make some improvement on. Thank you. Appreciate those comments. Okay, Councilmember Navarro. Thank you so much uh, for the presentation. I. Um, I was very curious when I first uh, took a look at this presentation of, as uh, it was mentioned, the piece that I think showed um, the yellow, just trying to understand what that meant, because I think in order for us to have, you know, a very clear picture of our county, and, and I'll just also share that I've been tracking all this with great interest um, even before I went into public office, uh, when I was running Central Familia, just tracking a lot of these shifts. And then when I became a member of the Board of Education, um, and there was this big focus on the non-focused and focused areas of the county where we saw, you know, a majority of ESOL mobility and farms began to see this picture kind of evolve. And so fast tracking to today, um, it is really very interesting to see how the change has occurred. And it, and it does have so much to do with, of course, you know, the step up housing issue, right? Um, the way that people just figure it out, if you will. Um, folks are attracted because of it is a high, high quality school system. And so education plays a big role. And at first it was just sort of this issue of 
emerging communities throughout. Um, but now what we're seeing is that, yes, if we want to normalize talking about who we are, um, I think that we can fairly say that it is, is it is a, a jurisdiction as majority people of color. And, you know, if we want to be frank, uh, oftentimes part of the discourse out there whenever we put forth any kind of proposal is predicated on this notion that if a jurisdiction is majority of color, somehow quality of life has to suffer. And we have not seen that in Montgomery County. We have our challenges, which we deal with on us every day. But when you look at every single institution, we have high functioning institutions. When you compare to other jurisdictions, you know, by every measure, we have high functioning institutions. But it doesn't mean that we can be complacent because if we don't really stay true to this notion of, you know, economic development in every corner of the county, right? Access to good paying jobs is critical. Um, areas of the county that continue to uh, suffer from what were decades and decades and decades of no investment in uh, amenities or things of that nature. Uh, that didn't happen by coincidence. It goes all the way back to the issue of covenants and all these, you know, redlining that existed. All of this still plays out. But I feel like this is an awesome moment um, to just truly shift the way that policymakers make decisions and, um, and, and also how we push the envelope in certain areas. Um, to, to, to stay true to these principles of equity. You know, equity is not just for people of color. You know, equity means that as we invest in all of our communities, the quality of life for the county will make, will be not only maintained, but enhanced. Because obviously, and, and, and what better than our, even our own rating agencies asking, you know, what are you doing? to incentivize redevelopment in other parts of the county outside the usual areas where we have focused. And to be able to turn around and say, you know, yes, we have Viva White Oak, we have, you know, uh, revitalization efforts in Wheaton, we're looking at different things up county where, you know, that was very interesting because access to economic sufficiency, access to jobs, you know, it helps everyone. And so, I, I just thought that it was a good moment to do a check-in because we will have an opportunity to do another one when the census results come out. Uh, but this is part of the narrative in terms of, you know, what we need to prioritize and, and, and how we need to get real about who we are. No more like identity crisis going on in Montgomery County where somehow, you know, we're afraid to say that we are a jurisdiction that is majority of color. I don't know what else we need to see. Like, you know, Gaithersburg is the second most diverse city in the country. It's just amazing. It's awesome. And our young people have such extraordinary opportunities here. You know, when my own young Afro-Latina, young professional daughters tra have, you know, traveled the world before the pandemic uh, and would come back and say to me, I'm so glad I went to Montgomery County Public Schools and I was raised, you know, in Montgomery County, right? Born and raised in this region, so glad because they are seamless in understanding our world. Um, we have to make sure that in our narrative, we always talk about all of that, all the rich uh, richness that we have. So, you know, I, again, I, I just think that it is pivotal for us, especially on this council, you know, Board of Education, Montgomery County Council, the administration and all of the department heads and everyone, it's pivotal to do a check-in periodically just to remind ourselves and then ask the question, have our policies, have our budgetary decisions mirrored those priorities? And if they haven't, then we need to make corrections because then we are not serving our constituents, nor are we truly uh, enhancing the potential and the quality of life in, in, uh, of this extraordinary county. Um, so, again, I, I really appreciate, you know, Corinne and Nick and, you know, um, this Wright, who, who's been a leader in all this, you know, Tanya, Carrie, everyone who has done this work and hope that we continue to have these conversations and these check-ins periodically. Um, 
And, you know, and whoever aspires a 2022 seat on this expanded body, I hope stays true uh, to prioritizing uh, the needs of this very diverse county and that it's not just in words, but it's in action and deeds as well. Thank you. Amen to that. Council Member Juwanda. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I know we've got a lot going on, so I, I will give a very small uh, statement and ask two questions and then do a lot of follow up with uh, with planning with with Miss Blackford and uh, uh, Mr. Holscomb. This is really great. And team, thank you guys for pulling this together. Um, you know, I look at this map and it's really like a it's a map of the American dream. Uh, you know, when you look at the expansion of diversity to now where here we sit in a county that when I was born, you know, in uh, 19, in the early 1980s, uh, just before this last map, you see how it's changed. We were segregated then with lower numbers of diversity, and we're still segregated now in some areas even more so. But you see the expansion and the resilience and the striving nature of communities of color, both foreign and domestic, that have spread out and branched out across the, the county. I mean, if that's not what America is about, I don't know what it is. And, it, and it's just really cool to see it over time like that, the way you all presented it. Um, and, and, and uh, you know, just personally having born and raised in Long Branch in the bottom right, you know, college age, moved to Silver Spring, a little left over, bounced back to the eastern part. Uh, you know, I, I've all these tracks I've 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 helped contribute to the pattern. And now I'm I'm outperforming on the childbirth, by the way, of four children. So, you know, step up, step up, county residents, and, and Councilman Robinson is doing the same. Um, but uh, you know, it's just really, really good to see. And so there's so many, so many implications for this uh of what we need to do. And what we've already done, it's just kind of reassuring to see, you know, the Councilmember Navarro's focus on racial equity that, you know, how blessed were the new council members, myself included, be able to come on. That'd be one of the first things we work on um, and put in place. And, uh, you know, so I guess just two quick questions. Um, you know, I had worked uh, a number of years ago prior to being elected with uh, a colleague of mine, uh, John Randall, who's since passed away to create something called Our Voices Matter. And the idea was, how do you get more civic engagement in communities that are the lowest income and have the lowest voter participation and turnout rates? Um, and we looked at the census tract and looked at the seven lowest income census tracts in the county as a place to start our work. Um, and that's a question I have. I'm assuming since the way you pulled this, do you all have a list or something that goes along with this to create that data you did, you must, of just all the census tracts ranked by income and how that has either changed or not changed over time and, and what the demographics, I'd be really interested in seeing a deeper dive on that. And maybe that's for Ms. Blackford. I don't know who's the right person to ask. Sure. Yeah, so um, aside from the map, we could also provide a table that just has the tracks um, and um, we could identify for you the lowest Five, ten, what, what, whichever ones you like, and then show you, you where they are. Point them. Yeah. And I'd be curious to see over time as well. Um, you mm -hmm. know how that, how that has has shifted. Mm -hmm. um, you know, because we've created these walls, and it's it's housing policy. Certainly, that ha land use has had a big deal. The lack of development. You know, the decisions that were made to intentionally not allow business development in parts of the county, um, but also, and then how that corresponds to affordability. Um, and, you know, the part of the story is just, you know, people of color, you know, when you come here looking for your shot at the American dream, or if you're internally moving, you're going to go where you can afford, where you can have a shot at your version of that American dream, you know, whether you're making 40,000 and you move up to 60. Um, and I think that's just as much a story of this too. And I think we just have to be very aware of that as we're crafting all of our policies. Um, so that'd be great. I'll follow up with you on that. The second question that I'm done is the, uh, the, the you mentioned there were two census tracts, and this is kind of a related question, that are 95% uh, or one per, uh, race or ethnicity. You know, could you just, do you know offhand, those stuck out, I'm sure. Do you know 
what I think I might know where they are. Do you know where those are? You know, I think they're in Tacoma lately, but I can double check and show you exactly. That's what I thought. That's where I, that's where I grew up. I think, because I just feel like, you know, we need to know, we also need to know how segregated we are, right? You know, and, 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 uh, and some of these have been stubbornly persistent, right? And so, um, and then for the first set of data, Ms. Blackford, you only went back to 2010. I'm assuming mm -hmm. you could go back to 1990 to correspond with your colleagues' data to show some. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. I'd be interested in that. But this is great. Uh, and obviously, you're going to have to update it all in a couple months. But, <laughs> but, but, uh, but uh, it, I think it's going to show similar trends. But thank you for your work on this and really excited to use it to inform our, our policymaking going forward. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Council Vice President Albernoz. Uh, thank you. Um, thank you, Councilman Navarro, for asking for this. Um, it really is sort of enlightening, and obviously it's just a tremendous amount of process, and it does confirm what we've been feeling, what we've been seeing, but to see it in such a, a clear and well-thought-through presentation is really helpful um, because it just hopefully provides a little bit more fire and push um, for us to continue the work we've been doing around economic development, around education, around quality of life issues that impact all of our various county residents. I mean, we, we projects like Viva White Oak um, are so important um, because we, we, we know that that will be the focal point moving forward. And, and I think, I, and I appreciate it so much of, some of you said it way more articulately than, than I ever could, but I just, I always find it so condescending and wrong to just assume as we create, you know, additional layers of diversity, which we acknowledge on a moral level is such a benefit culturally for all of us as a community, but it is a tremendous asset. Councilman Navarro has talked about that a lot. All of us have talked about that a lot, um, but we need to be more intentional about that. Um, and the fact that we have such a large percentage of our population speaking English as a second language is an asset in a global economy. And so we, you know, need to utilize this more intentionally as a selling point uh, for businesses, particularly global businesses that deal in global markets, so that the young professionals, to Council Member uh, Reamer's point, you're right, we need young professionals, but I think we got a lot of them right here. Uh, and, and, and we've got a lot of um, young professionals that have extraordinarily diverse backgrounds that we need to cultivate, that we need to double down on, that we need to work with our arts and entertainment uh, industry. I'll give you a couple of examples. The Fillmore, uh, which prior to the pandemic, um, for the first year was trying to figure out their rhythm, trying to figure out uh, where their market was. And the Fillmore um, really did something fascinating and, and, and amazing. Um, they started significantly diversifying the level of acts and artists that came to the Fillmore. And then they went from trying to find their way to becoming one of the top three live entertainment facilities of that size in the country. Um, and it was because they found their lane, they found their rhythm, and they were attracting uh, people from West Africa. They were attracting people from Central America and South America, hearing bands and hearing um, artists that really resonated and connected with individuals. And and thus, the Fillmore ended up becoming, and will, I'm sure, once we get out of the pandemic, a real destination spot for multicultural communities in a way that is powerful. So there, there are, there's a lot we can build upon here. There are concerns. We, we do have to have our eyes wide open. Um, the fact that we have an aging population and are not supplanting that aging population with the younger workforce um, is not sustainable. Um, and so that is something that we are going to have to focus on. And you know, in this complex ecosystem in any community, uh, you need to have a, a really important balance of people who are extraordinarily successful uh, and bringing in a significant amount of revenue that we can draw down from to assist with social services, and then also have a very strong and vibrant middle class that can afford to live here, uh, that does have growth potential over time, generational growth potential over time. Um, but but we have to be really intentional about it. So I'm, I'm excited uh, as we go into, um, um, you know, 
the, the, the Thrive formats uh, and what park and planning has been laying out. Um, and I think it is con really important for us to continue to take a holistic view in all of this because we often focus community by community. Uh, and that's why I love master plans. I've grown to really appreciate them um, and how they're all connected with each other. And I also believe it's important that this presentation, which on some level, you know, we're the choir. <laughs> like we, we get it, we see it. Um, this council has been extraordinary in, in being really front facing, um, but we need uh, uh, to bring in our, our chambers and our business community, um, our educational leaders uh, into this conversation too, because we've got to overlay uh, other important data points that are relevant such as what the educational attainment level is in our county. Uh, where, where, you know, in terms of like grob, job growth in various sectors that take advantage of a global economy, what are they? Where are they? How can we double and triple down on those? So all these things are um, obviously inextricably linked and it's helpful as a check-in moment, uh, which we're going to need to have more frequently um, in the way that we, I think it was presented in this presentation. Uh, and, and, and just a couple other things, you know, I, I can't help but think this a lot more often now. This has major public health implications as well. Um, you know, coming out of a pandemic, um, as, as, well, coming out of a pandemic, as we, as we think about, um, you know, what, what the, what the implications are from a public health standpoint, um, those are things we need to think about too, um, because that contributes and is a foundation of so many other issues. So, um, I, I appreciate this presentation. Uh, it probably brings up more questions uh, and more thoughts uh, moving forward, but it is immensely helpful. So thank you all for presenting it. Thank you, Councilmember Glass. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, and uh, thank you, uh, Councilmember Navarro, for requesting this. I thought it was a, a really good presentation and you know, in the concluding remarks, um, Director Wright, I, I appreciate how you combined this information and um, articulated the usefulness of this important information and how it has um, helped with the 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 Thrive process, which we're you know we'll we'll soon be undertaking as long along with the census, right? So we're at the confluence of a lot of different conversations, very timely conversations, important ones, but uh, all of this information uh, is, is of the moment. Uh, and so I, I appreciate that and, and, uh, and, and planning staff, thank you for all of this as well. Um, very, uh, I appreciate the salient points of my colleagues. And, and so I'll follow up because I have, I have uh, some nitty gritty questions um, just about some of uh, the precincts and, and other data points, but you know clearly we all know that demographics is destiny, and we see our destiny. And one of the data points I thought that was most revealing was the point that uh, foreign migration is greater into Montgomery County than domestic migration. And so you know proof that we are internationally known and desired, and something for us to. Uh, to continue to tout not only having so many diverse communities here nationally uh, ranked diverse communities, but international, an international destination uh, where people know that they will be respected, that they'll be welcomed uh, and included. Um, but resting on those laurels uh, is the easy part and the hard part are, are the policy making, making sure that uh, we fairly and equitably treat our residents um, and have an eye towards that. And so one of the things, uh, really the only question I'll ask now, um, there was a data point, um, um, and I think it was Mr. Holdscomb who, who mentioned this. Um, refresh my memory, there was a point about uh, um, uh, a bunch of the diversity, I can't remember, a third of the diversity being on less than a 10th of the land. There was something, some, do you recall that point? Right. Right. Yes. Um, yeah. Can you I, up I know. I, I know. I'm uh, inartfully recalling it, but no. No worries. No, you're absolutely. You're absolutely close. Um, so, so it was when we were talking about the equity focus areas, and the so the population within within those equity focus areas are about a quarter of the county. Yet that only makes up eight percent of the total land. 
and and those are the cog designated equity areas those are actually in-house derived so it so it it riffs it i'm sorry it doesn't even do that they staff created um their own parameters and metrics to determine ones that are specific for montgomery county rather than the cog based thing that uses the regional model and and makes it work for the region and I can, if I can just chime in real quick about the equity focus areas, that's a project we did um, to start with the general plan that we're continuing this year um, and to develop our own because then they're tailored more to the statistics uh, particular to the county. Um, and I'm happy to come back. We're happy to come back and talk about that. And we just completed a story map that we presented to the planning board last week that I can send around that explain, explains the methodology. It's really a, a screening tool to help us identify um, areas that have um, higher proportions of people of color, um, lower English proficiency, and lower incomes. Okay. Well, I, I love me some maps, so uh, we can we can do that either here or again when I follow up with you all. Um, but but um, Mr. Holtzcom, and, and maybe this is uh, more directed towards Director Wright as well. So so I'm curious what what your interpretation of that data set is. Right, that so much of that diversity, so much of of those equity areas are within such a tiny part of, of our land use, our land base. Sure. I mean, that's exactly, that's exactly what it says. And it speaks to uh, the population distribution of our county sort of as a whole. And through time, we see in the northern part, uh, it's, it's, it tends to be wider and the tracks are significantly larger than down county. Um, and, and so there is significant clustering down county and significant diversity down county. I think it's also, you know, not um, unusual. It, the down county neighborhoods are um, older. The housing is uh, of an older age, sometimes more affordable because it is older or smaller. Uh, and so those neighborhoods tend to be the ones where uh, people who are either of lower income or who are just starting out start. And then um, again, Council Member Rice has told a great story about his experience of, you know, moving from one part of the county to Germantown to the next <coughs> uh, neighborhood. And, you know, it, it, it is a sort of um, a very regular progression that we see. And I think some of our down county neighborhoods, particularly places like Tacoma, Langley, and so forth, are older, have older housing stock. They are places where uh, more recent immigrants can find affordable housing and uh, build communities that they feel comfortable in. And that builds on itself. So, um, you know, I uh, I think that we will see change continue to happen as people, you know, become established in their first neighborhood or their first house and then decide that they can, can move. And so I think we'll continue to see um, <clears throat> the county become more um, diverse with perhaps no specific um, ethnicity or race that's predominant because people will move from those older first neighborhoods into hopefully lots of the great housing opportunities we're going to offer throughout the rest of the county. Uh, well, um, I, I appreciate that interpretation. It makes, it makes sense to me. Um, what, what I'll share uh, in closing is that, you know, the particular areas that you described, the areas uh, that we uh, know are the equity emphasis areas where there are older, more dense housing stock. Um, you know, it's why when we when we think about affordable housing, we need to preserve, protect, and expand, right? And all hands on deck. Uh, and particularly the areas you just described where the purple line will be coming in. Um, these are these are tough issues that we will work through, uh, recognizing the public investment that we will be putting into that particular community. Um, and any other type of transportation infrastructure, there's no shortage of wish list items that we have here uh, and that you are looking into uh, at, at the planning department as well, um, but, but making sure we have that balance uh, so that we remain an international destination um, and we can utilize everyone's talents 
to continue making our community a vibrant and welcoming one. So uh, thank you for this. I'll certainly follow up um, and I yield back, Mr. President. Thank you, Councilmember Rice. Well, thank you very much. Um, one of the things is the district council member representing the North that I kept hearing and I just want to correct is that um, the majority of North is actually grown diverse uh, when you look at it. So it's not really North any longer, it's Northwest, which is Poolsville, which has a very small population and Damascus, which is Northeast and also has an equally small population. Um, outside of that, all the Northern areas are incredibly diverse as reflected in the yellows that you saw there. And I think it's incredibly important to understand. And I think it was something that when, uh, that uh, Director Wright said at the, uh, uh, a few minutes ago, which is that there has been this migration and it's something that council member Juwando and I had talked about just a little while ago too, is that it represents affordable housing opportunities. And so it's directly tied to housing opportunities. You know, growing up here in Montgomery County, I never went to Germantown. I never went to any of any of the places up County. I mean, I grew up in the Lay Hill area and Silver Spring was one of five black uh, uh, families in the neighborhood. Uh, you know, uh, Council Member Katz's chief of staff knows all too well as she also grew up in that same neighborhood. And uh, we oftentimes talk about the black families because we know exactly who they are and can rattle them off. That's, that's how much of an anomaly it was. Uh, and now to see us where we are and see places like Germantown to where it literally was, there were no black people. I mean, there were, don't get me wrong, but it was the same sort of thing. It was like a couple black households and everybody knew who they were and those kinds of things. And now to where it's incredibly diverse, so much so that it's one of the diverse, the most diverse communities in the nation um, between it and Gaithersburg and you know, even those areas are considered north compared to down county. So I just want to caution us into how we're having the conversation when we say north uh, and be very cognizant of that, because folks who don't know as much of may assume that it's one or the other. And we actually need to start specifically uh, saying about areas, right? So it's the Poolsville area, the Damascus area, uh, Dickerson. Those areas are the ones that remain traditionally white, uh, predominantly white, while our other jurisdictions have grown incredibly diverse. And so to put all that aside, it's incredibly exciting. Uh, it really is, because when I think about what my mother and father came here uh, for, you know, one leaving the deep, deep South in uh, South Carolina and Walterboro uh, to where there was uh, lynchings and uh, all kinds of things that happen in a regular basis. Uh, many of my colleagues know that my Great grandparents were actually murdered by the Ku Klux Klan, burned alive in a house. Um, these are realities that happened in the South not that long ago. And so folks escaped and came here seeking that better life. And oh, what a better life it has become. Because what has happened is, is not only has this area been nurturing for those of my parents' generation, but has also then spawned uh, additional folks to remain here in this area. And that's one of the things that I heard from Councilmember Reamer that I wanted to talk about as well. When I look at my graduating class, graduating class in 1990 from Montgomery Blair High School, a huge contingent of my graduating class still is here in Montgomery County um, in all different kinds of positions all over the county in different areas. Uh, and that says something uh, because I think that before there was a lot of tradition about going elsewhere, uh, and exporting Montgomery County talent. And there's been a lot of conversation about retaining that talent akin to what uh, Council Member Reamer is talking about. And I think that's been successful. Uh, and I think it will continue as we grow the economic development opportunities that are important. Because what happened before is Montgomery County was always just known as the place to live, not the place to work. Uh, and I think that now that we've started to swing you will see more of those young people now start to shift in this direction because more of those job opportunities are there and available. And quite honestly, I think that we'll grow more diverse because Councilmember Navarro made a point uh, about who those young people are and those young people are people of color. And so it will, by retaining those individuals, those young people of color and having them still remain here uh, and not matriculating into D.C. or into Alexandria and other parts of Northern Virginia, 
uh, the reality is, is that we'll grow even more diverse. Uh, and so it, 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 it really is exciting. Um, but I also do just want to acknowledge uh, that while it's exciting to us on this call, there's some folks who aren't necessarily excited, who are deeply concerned about the direction that this county is headed in. We need to take that and confront that head on as well. We have to acknowledge that also and understand that change is difficult uh, for a lot of folks, and especially when it comes to change like this. Uh, and certainly one in which I think that by having Thrive 2050 that lays out in great detail what it is, but also, and I think that I can't remember who made the point about how this diversity has truly helped us um, instead of hurt us. And I think it was Councilman Navarro, my big Councilman Reamer, I, I, I'm not sure, but um, one of them said, look how much we've gotten and, and grown in diversity. So, I mean, it's like when you think about all the growth that we've had as a county uh, in terms of what we've been able to do, like I said, growing economic development opportunities, growing when it comes to all the uh, accoutrements in our society that we want, building more parks, building bikeways, building all kinds of things that are incredibly important to our way of life uh, that is a positive one. You think to yourself, and that was done in concert with us growing as a community of color. Oh, and it was Council Member Navarro. Council Member Navarro, when you came on, it, 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 it uh, uh, refreshed my memory because that's what you always hear. You always hear, oh, well, if a community is of color, it's downtrodden, it's got huge issues with crime and all kinds of stuff. Well, for a long time, we've been a community of color. And guess what? You know, we remain one of the safest places, uh, one of the best when it comes to opportunities, all kinds of things. So. Again, it's, it's really exciting to see. Uh, it really is exciting to see what's happened in the up county region, an area that was solidly uh, non people of color uh, and who has turned on its head in such a short period of time uh, and really created, as Councilmember Glass said, a welcoming place for everyone. Uh, understanding that when it comes to diversity, it's not just a name, it's not just a pad word that we use here. We believe it. Uh, we, we eat you know, live, breathe, and sleep it. And so from that perspective, it really is one in which I think that for us, uh, it's it's going to be a tremendous selling point for uh, this county and for the future leaders uh, of Montgomery County as well. So I'm excited. I'm excited about what Thrive 2050 holds. I'm excited about what these trends hold. And I'm excited about what the census data uh, will also hold in terms of us really, truly putting forth a great message about what it means to be a diverse and successful uh, community. So thank you guys. Great work. When you're excited, we're excited. Council Member Reamer. Well, Council Member Rice just nailed it uh, in three different ways. Um, I was gonna follow up just to say that, you know, for us, the issue about our young workers has been losing them as much as not attracting them. And we've got to turn that around I don't think we've turned it around yet, but I think we have the wind at our backs for the first time in some time. And so, you know, a lot of that is is jobs. A lot of that is housing. Uh, but then it's all those other issues that, that you mentioned. And so, you know, I think we've got the right vision here at the council and we're working towards it. But we, we got to make it happen. And, you know, over the long term, I think we'll get there. But uh We've got to we've got to really open up the doors here, and and stop fussing over everything, and you know start putting some fuel in this engine uh, because when we when we're growing, when we're dynamic, when we're thriving, you know we see the results and who moves here, and in the end we reap the the better quality of life as a result. Thank you so much. Thank you, Councilmember Friedson. Thank you so much. This is a really fascinating, interesting, and important conversation really appreciate uh, councilmember navarro requesting it and appreciate the planning department for all of your great work and and thanks to colleagues for you know really thoughtful and and, and interesting comments you know i i heard earlier councilmember glass uh, mention uh, demographics or, or destiny and we're living our destiny now this isn't some far off uh, futuristic concept of what might happen down the road um, you know, I, I think we can all recognize the destiny of uh, yesterday is is life of today, and uh, the the 
county isn't changing, it's changed. And you know, now the question is, what do we do with it and how do we respond? And you know, I do think in many ways, this presentation was scientific confirmation of what we've been working on and so many of the things that we've been doing. And I think that we should uh, you know, really lean into that and, and really be proud of some of the changes that we've made. We certainly have a lot of work uh, to do, but uh, you know, heard Council Member Reamer you know, talk previously uh, in this discussion about ending the moratorium and making our impact taxes um, more affordable so that housing can be more accessible uh, for uh, new residents. We have desired growth areas to, uh, you know, to attract the, the activity centers that, that we're talking about and, um, you know, some of the racial equity and social justice lenses that we are uh, looking at all of our uh, issues. That's the lens that this whole presentation was presented. And that's the lens that we are now uh, living our lives. We don't have to put glasses on to see uh, these uh, issues, that is what is, you know, literally right in front of us. And, and, and it's important that we, uh, we look at these uh, issues and, 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 and look at the numbers and, and the changes and, and what they mean in, in a way like this. And so I just thought this presentation was really helpful uh, to put it before us so comprehensively and so succinctly uh, to, to, to really reflect uh, what we talk about uh, quite a bit. I, you know, I also thought that the, the the note about foreign migration being uh, higher than domestic uh, migration, I think is such an important uh, aspect. There's a previous demographic presentation by planning, which looked at the changing demographics of the county and the education levels of the county. I think what's not talked about enough is that our county is getting more diverse and more educated. So this false narrative of what new residents mean and what the changing demographics uh, of the county uh, reflect are not accurate, and uh, the the, uh, the the numbers are uh, are staggering. And I just think it's an important point and an important uh, th thing to push that some of our great assets, federal and uh, private, are attracting some of the uh, most talented people in the world. Some of our foreign-born population are by far some of the most educated uh, people in uh, our county, and they have uh, you know really uh, built upon. Uh, Montgomery County, and you know they're coming here because of what we value, and 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 their being here uh, is uh, a reflection of, of of who we are. And so I just think it's really important that we uh, you know talk about it that way. I also think it's important, you know, I think it's this conversation about immigration itself. You know, we talk about immigration as if it's uh, something that happens for the country at the borders, and we have our own versions of immigration right here. And you know, I've said before that housing is immigration policy at the local level. It's a decision very intentionally of you know who we want and who and what we value. And I just think that you know this really uh, reflects that in such a significant way. And uh, you know this this question of new residents, uh, young residents, foreign born residents, residents from out of the county, out of the region, out of the country, uh, you know, are they a burden or a blessing? And, you know, the reality is there's so many things uh, that have proven to, to demonstrate that that it is a, a blessing and such a huge asset uh, for the county. And I think we're, we're moving in the direction of really reflecting that, of really, you know, matching our reality to our rhetoric and the policies that we make and the decisions and choices uh, that we, we do here uh, as, as a county and in county leadership. And I just yeah, you know, I, I just wanted to, to to note that. I hope we can continue uh, those efforts, and I hope that we can continue to have uh, presentations like this where we're matching the data and making sure that we are uh, following uh, what is actually happening in reality, so that we're not making policy decisions in a silo, divorced uh, from the reality of the community that we serve. And I, I really think that this presentation was helpful in ensuring that, and I hope that. You know, as we talk about lenses, um, you know, we hopefully will get to a point at some point uh, where we don't need to have a lens to see what's right in front of us. And I think this presentation was a good step in that direction. And certainly we have a lot more work to do, but just want to appreciate everybody's efforts uh, to get to this place and uh, mention just how proud I am to live in Montgomery County, much less to be able to have the, the privilege and honor to be able to serve it. So thank you so much. Thank you, and Councilmember Katz. Thank you very much, Mr. President, and thank you, Councilmember Navarro, for for asking for this presentation. I, 
I was absolutely intrigued by it. I really was. Some of the things I knew, obviously, some of the things I didn't. We talk about diversity, and of course, I grew up in an area that has become the most diverse in in America. It was number one when when I, I always teased the mayor that it was number one when I was mayor. It's now number two, and and of course, uh, uh, Councilmember Rice talked about that when he was growing up a little further down county, that, that there was no reason for him to come to Germantown. He never went to Germantown. I grew up in Gaithersburg. There was no reason for me to go to Germantown. I had a, you know, a couple of friends there and you'd go to a party every now and then, but there was nothing there, nothing there. There was, there was the mill, the Liberty Mill, and there was a, a small bank and, and a post office and, a, and an elementary school from what I remember. There was nothing there and of course how much we've changed and the people that have come there that have that have started to, to live there you know um I, I did go to to a belong to a youth group in Tacoma Park so we went down county all the time but in the 60s I, I was teased Gaithersburg's population was 3,847 but I just looked it up again to make sure my numbers were right in 1960 that was the census and I had friends who teased me, and, and I enjoyed being teased, that Montgomery Blair High School in the late 50s had close to 3,000 people going to that school. That's how much we've changed in that time. And Seneca Valley probably has more than that 3,847 uh, people. So Seneca Valley pretty much is the same size as Gaithersburg is in 1960. Now, that sounds like a long time ago. To me, that isn't. But that sounds like a long time ago. But just as, and, and I'm going to stop on this, but the area that when I graduated high school in 1968, there are now seven schools, seven high schools in Montgomery County that have, that are now taking up the area that are part of the area where students went to Gaithersburg from. And that's Quince Orchard and Wooten. I can, I can list them if you'd like. But that shows you how much growth we have had in a lifetime. And it really is a condensed lifetime. I mean, the, some of these are newer schools in comparison. So it is, it is no surprise to me in many ways of how we've changed. And it's no surprise to me when, and thank goodness we have the ag reserve. Uh, I want to be very clear on that, but it's no surprise that you don't have population in an ag reserve. But that's that's not what the Ag Reserve is about. And if we didn't have the Ag Reserve, I can tell you, we would have had a whole lot more population and it would have been newer housing. And, and I, I was, let me end on this one. I remember vividly, vividly, that Gaithersburg City had 66% apartments in it and we didn't have townhouses and we, we had single family homes, the rest of it, nobody heard of townhouses or few heard of townhouses, 66% apartments. And it was, it was a, a concern because we wanted to make sure that there was other uh, uh, possibilities for people to have residential units and different residential units. So it was worked on to change that. But we have, we have changed dramatically and needed to change dramatically over the years. And I think we are, I think we need to continue to have the conversations. I think the only way we can get to the better place, which we've gotten to in many, in some cases, the only way we can get to a better place is to continue conversations like this with so many others. And then of course, we can all talk about the city of Rockville. Their, their housing has changed dramatically over the years because of the, of the they have so many existing houses but then King Farm and Thomas Farm and all those areas also change. So anyhow, intriguing conversation. Look forward to many, many more. Thanks. In intriguing is right. Well, thanks so much to Council Member Novato for requesting this. And thanks to Director Wright and Ms. Stern and Ms. McCarthy for pulling it all together and all the staff uh, who worked on it. I'm sure there are many that probably weren't even here. Um, demographics are absolutely destiny, as Council Member Glass said. And this is a very helpful mirror to hold up to help us understand and appreciate our destiny in Montgomery County. We can either embrace the future or reject it, and this will help us understand and embrace it. We have a lot of work ahead, uh, and we have to approach it from the most clear-eyed and most well-informed perspective. So thank you all for your hard work to help us get there.
We'll see you again soon. And now colleagues, without further ado, we can move on to legislative session day 12, um, especially after today and all the progress we're making on the pandemic, we can see the light at the end of the budget tunnel and we'll, we'll soon be able to think about policy again. So we have a few bill introductions to allow our residents to consider them um, before the committee schedules any work sessions. First is an introduction for Bill 1721, Community Informed Police Training, Council Member Juwando. Mr. President, and uh, this uh, appreciate the opportunity to just make a brief comment. Um, and I wanna acknowledge, uh, I've not in time for the, uh, the production of the packet, but Council Member Reamer, uh, who uh, has asked to co-sponsor and really appreciate that. Um, you know, we've done a lot of work and I appreciate my colleagues working with, with me on this uh, issue and us collaboratively to reimagine public safety and policing and started off with the LED Act uh, back in 20, January of 2019. And we've done a number of other efforts, whether it be the Police Advisory Committee, the uh, the community policing bill, the use of force bill that we passed over the summer, uh, the data transparency, uh, go down the list. But a, a key component of what we need to do, uh, in my view, um, is not only transparency and accountability, which we certainly need, um, we have to change our hiring practices, who we're bringing in, how we're building. You know, this conversation was just so apropos of who our demographic is. Uh, there are 600 students in the criminal justice program today at Montgomery College. Three fourths of them are live and are from Montgomery County. That's almost half the department that we have right now. Um, and most of them are students of color. They actually, the prime, most of them, the majority of them are Latino. Um, and uh, we, we did a uh, event today at Montgomery College highlighting this important aspect of the police reform conversation and certainly who we're bringing in. And there's been a lot of discussion of people are retiring. We have an aging population. We were just having some of this, co uh, this conversation and we're gonna need to backfill in a whole range of areas, but certainly in public safety. And so we have this unique opportunity at this moment in time to reform and change the, and put the systems and structures and people in place who are gonna be the folks that deliver equal justice under the law and who deliver upon uh, rolling back the disparities that we've seen. Um, and this bill is, is a part of that in my view. Um, and what it would require uh, is that the department would have to work with the local institution of higher education and in this instance, Montgomery College, I've worked with them and I wanna thank Dr. Pollard um, and her team. I've worked with them over the last year to develop uh, a 30 hour, five week proposal, uh, five week course rather, that focuses on things that our police currently aren't learning. Uh, things, racial equity and social justice, uh, communication skills, uh, conflict resolution, the history of policing, uh, being grounded in our community's racial and ethnic diversity um, and a whole range of, of, of other topics that with the focus that not only will they be trained and better prepared to interact with our population, but also that this can be used as an evaluative tool. Uh, and another component of the bill requires that performance in this course, which is mandatory for any new recruit prior to entrance into the academy under the bill, uh, has to, it also has to be used, the performance in this course, to evaluate acceptance into the academy. So it's, it's a recruitment tool for a new, diverse, uh, and uh, more highly trained set of uh, new recruits. Uh, it's also used as a opportunity to evaluate so that we are getting the best guardians uh, to protect and serve uh, our community, our very diverse community, as we just heard. Um, and then it also requires continuing education credits for current police officers and for police leadership, because if you're gonna have culture change, you need to have everyone on the same page. Um, and so this would lengthen the amount of time. We do 24 weeks in our academy. This adding five weeks would take, take it to 29 uh, and by 20% increase and in partnership with Montgomery College or in the future, potentially other institutions of higher education. My hope is that this will be a seed that grows and uh, we can continue to expand our professionalism and training. 
the, I'll end with this. The United States has some of the lowest levels of police training in the, in the world, in the industrial, industrialized world. You go to Europe or Asia, police train one, two, or three years. Uh, and we do 24 weeks. And in the U.S., it's anywhere between 14 and 30 weeks. And, they're, and most importantly, we're not learning these types of critical skills uh, that can help save lives and reduce disparities in policing. So uh, I'm hoping that uh, colleagues will co-sponsor. I look forward to the conversation uh, over the coming weeks and months. Uh, and again, thank Dr. Pollard and her team at Montgomery College for partnering uh, and helping to develop this curriculum. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Council Member Jawando. Um, Next is an introduction for Bill 1821, Police Internal Affairs Procedures and Reporting Requirements that I've introduced. Um, let me just explain this one quickly, um, as quickly as I can. We were all shocked by the horrible incident in January 2020 involving two MCPD officers and a five-year-old boy in my district at East Silver Spring Elementary School. And I know we all watched the footage in complete dismay. In addition to the mistreatment of a child, equally shocking and relevant to us since we don't supervisor trained police officers, but we provide oversight to the department was that we on the council, much like everyone else, even the county executive, were only made aware of the horrific nature of this incident 14 months after it occurred. The state's attorney did not learn about it until 14 months later either. So any possibility of a criminal investigation was eliminated because the statute of limitations had run out. I've learned that that happens with some frequency, that the state's attorney does not learn about potential police misconduct until often after a year uh, after each incident. There is a unfortunate and glaring lack of transparency and oversight over our body-worn camera footage. We have a very extensive body-worn camera policy, but it's incomplete because it doesn't prioritize transparency by providing review and sharing of information about investigations with public officials or our residents. All of us have said that we're interested in making sure an incident like this never happens again. And honestly, I'm worried about how often similar incidents may have happened that we never learned about because there may have not been a lawsuit or a reporter to bring it to our attention. We can't change the past, but we have to close the loopholes in our body-worn camera policy to make sure we can perform our oversight responsibilities properly. So immediately after that incident, I began some conversations with stakeholders, including my predecessor in this seat, former council member Cherie Branson, now with the NAACP and others at the branch, other stakeholders, including police officers and management, the state's attorney, the ACLU, many of my colleagues. Um, grateful to Council Member Glass for his suggestions on this, and Council Members Reamer and Juwando for their support, and Ms. Christine Wellens and Ms. Susan Frog for their input into this as well. This legislation, I believe, adds a lot of transparency to our body-worn camera footage and will help us strengthen our community and police relations. Specifically, it requires random reviews of body-worn camera footage so we know how our officers are behaving when they interact with the public. And while we collect thousands of hours of footage, fortunately not many of those hundreds of incidents results in an investigation. So it also adds transparency of serious investigations by requiring reporting to the county executive, to the county council, and to the state's attorney about any serious investigations. We receive regular reports of many less important matters. We should know every time there's an investigation of a police-related incident that involves the use of force or a child under the age of 18 or a potential criminal offense by a department employee or a fatality or potential discrimination or harassment. The bill also requires a body camera on every officer in uniform because we should not be sending officers out on the street without a camera. And because many of our investigations take so long, it requires MCPD to provide us an explanation whenever an investigation takes longer than the DOJ believes it should. Improving our police and community relations can't be achieved without hard work and meaningful, invest, uh, meaningful legislation. Our police department has excellent technology and resources at their fingertips and excellent staff. Through our actions, our taxpayers have invested many millions in our body-worn camera program, but it's our job to ensure those resources are being used to ensure the increase the community trust in our most important public safety agency. So with that, I'll welcome your support. Council Member Glass. Thank you very much, Mr. President. I uh, would like to be added as a co-sponsor to this bill. I appreciate you introducing it and, and the conversations that we've had about it. You know, the bottom line here is this is about transparency and clarity 
you know, the over the last number of years or number of years ago when, when the policy was created, uh, their, um, you know, technology and the times um, warrant us to update those policies. Um, and, you know, the bottom line, <laughs> the bottom line here is, um, you know, we learned about this incident, the incident that you referenced, and, and uh, to be a little more explicit, the incident at East Silver Spring involving a five-year-old child. We learned, we the council members, I as a council member learned about it through an intrepid journalist with Bethesda Beat on January 22nd. And incidents of this nature, we should not be learning about um, from intrepid journalists. We should be hearing about it uh, from uh, our own county colleagues here in government. And so uh, so look forward to the conversation on this and thank you for, your, for the introduction. Thank you, Council Member Nevado. Thank you, I'd like to be listed as a co-sponsor, thank you. Thank you. Okay, thanks everyone. Now, Mr. President Member Rice. Uh, yeah, I'd like to be added as a co-sponsor as well, thank you. Thank you, sir. Okay, now we have an introduction for Bill 1921, Finance Reports on Settlement Agreements, Council Member Jawado. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, and this goes uh, very nicely and, and I, I appreciate you uh, working on this as well and, and uh, co-sponsoring uh, with the previous conversation. Uh, you know, all of us have been aware of these incidents of uh, misconduct in, in the policing side, but also in other parts of government. Um, uh, that have led, and we found out, some of us have been served at our at our homes about lawsuits, um, about misconduct from government officials. And we find out that there are various suits that are in process and there have been various settlements that have been made uh, to uh, uh, to kind of settle out of court these, uh, these lawsuits. And I uh, have been digging into this issue and this has come up, not only do we not know about them on the front end, there's very little transparency on the back end about what happens and what county taxpayer dollars are being paid out uh, to uh, folks to settle these claims. And we have an insurance policy and it's funded by taxpayer dollars and, and these happen. And so this bill is pretty simple, but it's important. Uh, it would require that uh, on the, by October 1st of every year, the, uh, the office of uh, the county attorney would report in, uh, to the council and to the county executive and publish on data Montgomery and produce a report that goes on the website of all the settlements uh, that have been made uh, based on misconduct by government officials. And it would require four things that the claim, the claimant or the claimants uh, who are involved, the dollar amount or other consideration that is given under the settlement, the nature of the claim. So what happened in this case, obviously we know with this uh, poor little boy who was failed by every system, that's the nature of the claim. The county departments and the offices involved and uh, really basic information, but that is not available. Uh, reporters, I've talked to many reporters who are constantly trying to FOIA and get information on in this. And it was mentioned by Councilmember Glass, the, an intrepid journalist who found out a year later because of a lawsuit. And she only found out because a lawsuit was filed. Um, and so we have to know what's going on. It's, it's a, our duty as elected representatives. Um, and it also informs our ability to conduct oversight and to improve our, our safety and practice for all of our residents. So uh, really appreciate the support and, and hope colleagues will co-sponsor this as well. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Glass. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, uh, I'm not going to reiterate what I said in the previous uh, introduction because much of it does apply, as, as Councilmember Jawando uh, mentioned. Uh, but for me, this is about uh, taxpayer accountability, making sure that the hardworking taxpayers of Montgomery County understand where their money is going. And just like we are going through a budget process right now, um, this legislation would provide a full and uh, accurate accounting of how uh, how we handle um, some of the incidents that, that unfortunately occur here in county government. So um, thank you, uh, Council Member Jawando. Thank you, Council Member Reamer. Thanks, I'd like to be added as a co-sponsor. This has been an issue that certainly has been uh, on my mind for some time. Appreciate Council Member Jawando uh, taking the lead to put together the legislation. Thank you. Council Member Rice. Thank you, I'd like to be added as a co-sponsor. Council 
Council, uh, Council Member Novato. I'd like to be added as a co-sponsor as well. Thank you. Thank you all. Okay. And Council Member Glass, were you asking to be added as co-sponsor? You didn't say that, but I, if not, that's okay. But I just, I just didn't want it to pass if you did. Uh, yes, if I, if if I didn't say it, and you were probably listening better than I uh, to myself, uh, yes, I would like to be added as a co-sponsor. Thank you. Terrific. Okay. If there's nothing else on Bill 1921, we can move on to introduction for expedited Bill 2121 Fire and Rescue Services Length of Service Awards Program for Volunteers Amendments. Lead sponsor is Council President, the request of the County Executive. Mr. Drummer. Uh, is there anything to say about this one? Well, this is part of the collective bargaining agreement with the Montgomery County Volunteer Fire and Rescue Association. Uh, the length of service awards is similar to a retirement plan for volunteer firefighters. They receive a monthly pension uh, based on uh, how long they worked as a volunteer. And this includes raises for the bill includes raises that were rejected in FY21 uh, that are part of a supplemental appropriation and the raises that were negotiated for FY22. Uh, so the council would need to consider the supplemental appropriation or amend this legislation ultimately. Uh, the council did approve we collect the bargaining agreement with the volunteers for FY22. So to that extent, this bill is just implementing what you've already approved. The FY21 increases are still in front of you or are yet to be decided on the supplemental appropriation that came over just last week, I believe. Right. Or maybe even this week. I'm not sure. It was pretty recently. Recently. But today we're just introducing it, right? Just introducing it. Okay. It's good. I think it's scheduled for public hearing and action on June 15th when you come back. June 15th it is. You're correct. Thank you. Okay. Uh, expedited Bill 2121 is introduced. Thank you so much, Mr. Drummer. Next is item 11, the call a bill for final reading. Uh, consideration first of expedited Bill 2220 was previously tabled. Councilmember Katz would like to make a motion to untable it. Councilmember Katz. Thank you very much, Mr. President. And I would like to move to take Bill 2220 from the table under Council Rule of Procedure 10, subsection D. Section D, which we're all familiar with. And Council Member yeah. seconds it. Terrific. Um, yeah. All those in favor of the motion, please raise your hand. Great. That is unanimous. And now, is there a motion to approve of the resolution? Is that Council Member Katz again? Yes, it is, and I so move, Mr. President. Councilmember Second. Wright, are you seconding? Okay, uh, Councilmember Navarro seconds that one. Madam Clerk, can you please call the roll? <laughs> Mr. Glass? Yes. Mr. Glass votes yes. Mr. Jawando? Yes. Mr. Jawando votes yes. Mr. Reamer? Yes. Mr. Reamer votes yes. Mr. Katz? Yes. Mr. Katz votes yes. Mr. Navarro? Yes. Mr. Navarro votes yes. Mr. Rice? Yes. Mr. Rice votes yes. Mr. Friedson? Mr. Friedson vote just. Mr. Albernoz? Yes. Mr. Albernoz vote just. Mr. Hucker? Yes. Mr. Hucker vote yes. Thank you so much, Madam Clerk. Uh, expedited Bill 2220, position creation, position alteration, Director of Strategic Partnership and Director of Com Criminal Justice Coordinated Commission is passed unanimously. And colleagues, unless there's any further ado, we are adjourned. Good work. See you tomorrow morning. We will continue to monitor transportation conditions throughout the day.